And hopefully, as we're waiting to get started, you're recognizing, as I am now, that really there's no better place to practice than when we're waiting. And another thing we notice when we're waiting is this habit that many of us have at least to postpone our practice, somehow justifying, I'll do it later, or I'll get started later, or this isn't the right moment. You don't, we don't need to change our posture or even change anything much. Just recognizing now how far away is our practice. Or just checking with your own experience now. How does practicing change things? Does it change? Thanks. And maybe you're even noticing some confusion, some doubt, maybe even some humiliation about, I'm not sure I know how to practice with this moment. I feel a little bit on the spot. Am I doing it right? Of course, all of that activity can be recognized as that, recognized for what it is. It's that mental activity being known, any emotional content being felt, And just checking what kind of effort right now in our experience sitting here, what kind of effort is needed to 
be actually sincerely interested in the moment. Or what if anything is in the way of being interested? What's the mind doing right now? And can there be an awareness of what the mind is doing without judging or feeling obliged to fix things? And as Shelly mentioned earlier in the day, the way we're going to be practicing these eight days, we often call it an awareness orientation as opposed to meditation that has an object orientation. Of course, we recognize the awareness because awareness is knowing objects, knowing experience. It's not really two different things, the awareness and the experience that's being known. It's just really a matter of emphasis, a matter of interest. We're interested in the truth here in the moment that experience is being known, that there's knowing. So how can we recognize that there's knowing now? And we're valuing awareness enough that we're going to keep it in mind. Of course, we'll forget that it's important, that it's relevant. Then we'll remember, we'll be reminded, Shelly and I, Gabe, keep reminding everyone. But generally, It's not our habit to be interested in awareness, which tends to be subtle and therefore not easily remembered. I'm not sure subtle is the right word. In a sense, it's so omnipresent that the habit of the mind is to be dismissive. One thing I say sometimes in the introduction to mindfulness class, you know, when I'll ask people to 
I'll define mindful awareness and I'll ask people to recognize that there is awareness here and now. <clears throat> kind of like we've been doing. And then I'll say to them, well, can you stop being aware now? Can you shut it off? And any frustration or whatever the reaction now is to that question, you'll see it's just more stuff being known, being felt. So the way we've organized this retreat experience you know, it's a relatively relaxed and open schedule. Shelley and I have not packed the schedule, made it tight. But it's not that, you know, it's really more in the service of that continuity to use the whole day. No breaks, really. And no preferencing the time we're in this room or you're in your meditation seat at home over the time you're in the bathroom or helping in the kitchen or taking a walk outside. Doesn't matter what posture we're in, what room we're in, what kind of mood we have. And that's a really important thing because it's not our, you know, our conditioning or habit. All of us, you know, more or less have been corrupted where we think practice is when we're sitting still in a full lotus posture, looking serene and everything else is sort of a break <laughs> until your next perfect perfectly still meditation period. So we really want to break that habit and get curious about the whole day, no part of the day more important than another part. So really notice like when you go into your bedroom or when those of you at home, when the Zoom is off, notice how there's an attitude like, whew, Free to be me. <laughs> I don't have to be a Buddhist meditator. I don't have to be mindful. No one's watching. And of course, all of those kinds of thoughts are totally okay and appropriate because that's, that's what the nature of the mind does. It thinks those kinds of thoughts. And interestingly, that reflective awareness can recognize, oh yeah, those thoughts are being known. Now it's like this, thinking that I'm having a break, thinking that I can act out. I can gobble up my little stash of food that I have in my room that nobody knows about. Or those of you at home, you know, <laughs> all the temptations, But this is the interesting thing about our mind and our karmic situation. There's really no escape because the only mind that's relevant is always there. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in Dharma comes from Ajahn Sumedho. I consider him a really important teacher of mine listened to so many of his talks over the years and read all the books that he's written. And um, that he has, I think it was the title of one of his earlier booklets. And the full line is something like, the past is gone. The future isn't here yet. Now is the knowing. 
especially that last piece, now is the knowing. It's really an important pointing out instruction that what's most relevant now is the knowing. In fact, now is knowing. Any sense of now without a sense of knowing isn't now. <laughs> it's, you know, delusion or the mind lost in thought. But any real sense of now comes with a real sense of knowing. You could just try that in your own mind now. <laughs> you know, and just, to, you know, how it gets weird if you say it too much, but just in a relaxed way, silently in your minds, you know, just now. This. Here and now. And you see that the default of the mind is to recognize the awareness, the knowing. There's knowing. This is being known. Now is the knowing. And I often mention, you know, we can feel initially a little awkward like not sure we should be aware in this more simple, direct way that somehow we've, I mean, picked up this unhelpful, deluded idea that life is done best if we're not really there or not really paying attention, not really sensitive, not really connected. You know, and when we say that out loud, of course, it just doesn't make sense. But unconsciously, habit, you know, in terms of our habits, that's sort of how it works, you know. Unconsciously, the habits that are operating are almost as if they're saying, how can I line up enough effective distractions one after another to get me through the day, through the week, through the month, through the year, through the life. Some of you have probably listened to some of the um, Q&A sessions that have been recorded when Saida Bhutashaniya has been here in the West teaching. And uh, we've been fortunate that often when he's come to the United States and other Western places to teach, he's brought this wonderful uh, practitioner. She's really a teacher too. Ma Tat, um, I think she's from Singapore. And, uh, but she's just an excellent translator and a really uh, great student of the Dharma. And they have a real, they, you know, when they're teaching together, when Ma Tat is translating, they just uh, have a really great rhythm together. And once you summarize, sometimes, you know, you can almost sense it's Ida sort of intuitively saying, you know what to say. So she says it. So anyway, she said it this way. She said, Saida has covered everything he needs to about the attitude to meditation. And our job henceforth is only three. First, have right view. Second, be aware of right view. Third, continue to be aware of right view. That one always makes people laugh. There's not a lot to do, just these three. So, you know, you probably remember um, Shelley and I have talked about these four instructions. You know, Saida has talked about, you know, introducing the practice in different ways, but usually it comes around to some version of these four instructions. Honey, it's okay to relax. So 
one way or another, inviting relaxation, being interested, always here and now, being interested in recognizing, oh, there is awareness. So again, it's important that we don't think, oh yeah, that second instruction is about me being aware, but it's really more a kind of interest to recognize that there is awareness already. That capacity, whether that awareness is really has some momentum and stable and clear or not, but to recognize that there is awareness. And the, the troublesome thing about that second instruction is the very deep habit that that's not relevant. You know, whatever we think awareness is, it comes with the habit. It's not relevant, awareness. Like I said a, a few moments ago, it's so, it has been and is so omnipresent that it doesn't occur to the conditioned or habit bound mind that it needs to be recognized or remembered. And then the third is, to keep remembering, like learning how to keep that valuing of awareness, that interest in awareness, that recognition of awareness, to keep that in mind, to keep interested, to keep recognizing that there is awareness. And then this last, which I want to talk a little bit more about tonight, wise view, that word sama, S-A-M-M-A, usually gets translated as right. And I'm sure for a lot of us that can push our buttons, you know, it, it kind of feels like, well, if it's right, then you can be wrong. And I don't like when things are good and bad, dualistic in that way, that can't be Buddhist. But from the, our point of view, maybe from an absolute point of view, that's true, but we're not, in that absolute place, we're deluded beings. All of the Dharma is for deluded beings. In all these teachings and practices, they're not for awakened beings, they're for deluded beings. People who are very much addicted to dualistic notions of good and bad. So the Dharma, and using that word Dharma as a set of teachings and practices, it exists in this dualistic world for us dualistic people or people with dualistic minds. We use delusion, you know, and the simile in the Buddhist teachings is you might remember the raft, right? To cross the floods of our, you know, deluded ways of conceiving, conceptualizing and identifying with what the mind thinks and conceptualizes and and having problems. So we build a raft, we have a set of teachings and practices, and it says, you know, there's wise view, there's right view, there's, I like Ajahn Sushito's translation of Sama, complete, the complete view, the real view. You know, we could probably use any number of words Somebody else, I think, translated sama as even, like a view that's aligned with the way it is. So I think that's what Ajahn Sushito means when he uses complete instead of right. It's a way of showing up, for example, to this moment. And the way the mind is showing up, the frame the way the mind is perceiving experience, the way the mind is understanding, the way the mind is connecting and relating is in alignment with the way it is. So it fits nicely. As opposed to like when I'm relating to this moment with a, you know, a common dualistic notion. Oh, Common Ground Retreat Center is so great. And the rest of the world, not so great, right? So I have that particular lens. And uh, 
you see, it doesn't fit quite right because then the things that are, you know, just what they are here, but not rosy, not perfect, I can't see those because the idea is this is great and the city is bad. So a wise view is a view that always fits because its frame, its way of connecting isn't distorted by expectations or by any conceptions whatsoever. So that's wise view. You can almost say, I mean, it's not quite right, but you, we can almost say that wise view is no fixed view because that allows us. So when we say like, you know, last night when I was talking about this fourth instruction that we're gonna play with all week long, right? We're just playing with these four things in skillful, creative, nimble ways valuing relaxation, finding your own version of, honey, I'm pretty sure it's okay to relax right now. It's okay to soften. It's okay to put down whatever load can be put down right now. That whatever it is I'm doing here on retreat, with these other folks, it doesn't require being tight or bound. I might feel tight and bound, but I'm not going to consciously rationalize being tight and bound. I'm going to instead be curious about what is being held and what can be put down, what tension is there and what can be released. And we're going to play with, you know, recognizing awareness. Is the mind aware? How do I know the mind's aware? Is there awareness? Well, there must be because I'm hearing my voice. I'm feeling my open hands. I'm seeing this visual experience. I heard that sound. Awareness is knowing. Awareness is doing what awareness does. Okay. Can I continue to be interested in awareness, the knowing, the now is the knowing? Can I keep that in mind? Like there's so many, you know, we have so many habits of problem solving and planning and valuing experiences. I like it, I don't like it. So to learn how to keep that value of awareness in the forefront. And this, the interesting thing about this last instruction, you know, last night I talked about it as, oh, this is nature, not self. Like seeing whatever we're experiencing, internal experience or external experience, seeing it as a natural process. And you know, that, that challenge with this fourth instruction isn't to pick it up in a way that leads to mental proliferation. I mean, it does involve skillful thought. We're skillfully using the thought, like even the thought, wise view, <laughs> the complete view the view, the way of connecting that is in alignment with the way it is. You know, and so that word like, oh yeah, this is a natural process. Whatever I'm feeling, thinking, seeing, hearing, touching, that is just this lawful unfolding. And any that includes any reactivity, includes any liking or not liking, includes doubt and confusion. Well, yeah, that's a natural process too. So the way that, uh, you know, the Buddha actually makes a big deal of this. We don't talk about this too much. Some of the later Buddhist traditions make 
more of a point of this, they call it like a pointing out instruction. But it's right there in the early suttas, this importance of connecting with the teacher and getting some new information that's out of the box, you know, that challenges our normally going about framing our experience. So in sort of the classic mode, you know, somebody tells you about some wise person and you Google that person, you know, and you see if there's any controversies. <laughs> and then you go to the website and you try to get some intuition about like, how do they deal with money? They seem pretty straightforward. Or is it a scam? You know, and all those sort of things that we do. And then if if all the things look good enough, we might listen to or read something they wrote or listen to some talk, you know. And if all the boxes get checked and kind of passes the, the taste test, you know, then we might sign up for a program with them. And we might, you know, keep checking them out until we're like, oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna be. I'm going to work with this person. I'm going to use their articulation because it really, it's, it has two qualities. One is um, a lot of what this person says, how they talk about human existence and human suffering and the possibility of release and freedom from that suffering lines up with my experience and makes sense. And some of what they say is really edgy for me. Like, I don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about something that's outside of my direct experience. And it's provocative. It's interesting. And I feel inclined to check it out. And this is sort of, this uh, really goes to this fourth instruction where the Buddha is saying, some version of, hey, whatever your experience, whatever's being known, it's a natural process. There's no you or center or permanent fixed point anywhere in anybody's experience. There's just the habit of each of us imputing a fixed point, a fixed location of a me mine, I, me, or mine, right? But even that is just something being known in that very fluid and unfixed sense. I was trying to say this, uh, maybe it was last night, I guess. You know, even when during our retreat time here, these eight days, we have one of those storms, you know, of reactivity, of shame, humiliation, or whatever it is. And it's just from our subjective point of view, it just so clearly feels like there is a me who is suffering. <laughs> no doubt about it. I'd put a lot of money on it. <laughs> you know, like this is such an obvious experience. And the teachings and this particular point I'm making about wise view it doesn't negate those moments, those periods of time when, when it feels very clear, like I am suffering in a very personal way. I am stuck, I'm full of doubt. I feel like a failure, I shouldn't be here. Everyone's doing it better than me or I'm doing it so much better than everyone else. I should be in the front of the room or any of the kind of dramas that we can have when we're on retreat. And really it's everything under the sun, the kind of dramas people have on retreat. But wise view doesn't have a problem and it doesn't need that drama to be different than what it is. No drama you can have is a problem for wise view because all wise view is saying is 
it's basically the Buddha and all the wise people before us saying, hey, we've tried it all and we found the best way to relate to this drama that's going on is to recognize it, to see it, to relate to it, to connect with it as a natural process. It's just nature. It's just causes and conditions. And there's something about that way of relating to whatever experience, you know, I've been talking about more challenging experiences that can come our way, but it's really exactly the same if we're having a period of time where there's a lot of balance, a lot of stability of awareness, a lot of wholesome emotions, gratitude and, and uh, calm, kindness, you know, those qualities also show up from time to time, right? And it doesn't really change. It's like, well, that's a natural process too, being known. It's in motion. Doesn't refer back to anything that's fixed or permanent. It's just that activity of wholesomeness or that activity of unwholesomeness or that activity of mixed wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. That's all it could be, one of those three. But either the moment is mostly wholesome, but in any case, it's fluid, it's changing, it's unfolding, or it's mostly unwholesome, in which case it's just moving, changing, flowing on, or it's a mix of wholesome and unwholesome. But we, it, and so the question is, and this is what we have to initially borrow from our wise ancestors, like that it's skillful. It's not only like true, that's actually not so relevant that it's true and you know, that, it, that it's in alignment with the way it is. What's more relevant to us is that it's onward leading. Like using wise view sets emotion insight. It changes who we are. That's why we do it. We're not doing it to be right. Like I got right view. And you leave the retreat with your blue ribbon. Right view. Got right view. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you have any blue ribbons, but, you know, but then you got to find a wall to put them up on. Dust them off. And then it's always like, should I have my blue ribbons on the wall or not? Maybe you're even more cool if you have blue ribbons, but you don't have to put them on the wall. Right? So it isn't about, it isn't like an accomplishment. It's an onward leading thing. But we have to use wise view before we have the results of wise view. And that's why the way Buddha talks about this pointing out, this um, transmission of the Buddha's wisdom, where we have, that's what makes the Buddha the Buddha, right? Because there are a lot of people at the time of the Buddha and probably throughout history, according to the Buddha, who had the same awakening, the same depth of understanding that the Buddha had, but they didn't necessarily have the capacity, the personality and the ability to articulate the process in a way that could be pointing out instructions for the rest of us, that be useful for the rest of us. So that's kind of the technical definition of a Buddha is they can talk about what happened to them in a way that's useful for us. So we hear some version of, hey, everything, this experience right here and now, it's a natural process. Something is being known and that never ceases. It's always anew, right? This is being known and that's connected. It's conditional, like what's being known and how I'm knowing affects the next moment that's being known. And the way to get really close and to have insight and to be transformed by that insight 
is to use that way of framing. Well, this is a natural process. So we need, initially we need something, you know, you could even say artificial, let's call that the Buddhist teachings on wise view, which we pick up and use because it is a perfect counterweight for ignorance, right? It diffuses, it neutralizes wrong view. That's what wise view is. It's ideas or conceptual framing that neutralizes wrong view, which is this unseen habit of everything I experience is always in terms of me, mine. I, you know how that, like, do you notice even now there, there's just that you can sense that framing self framing mechanism, because there's always a little anxiety behind the scenes. Can you feel it? You know, it's always there. And that's because we're framing in this tight way, this fixed way, presuming that this is just how it is. There is a me who's having an experience and I'm not in control and I don't know what you're thinking about me or even what I think about myself. And so there's always this endless jockeying for like trying to create some solidity, some fixedness, some location in a very fluid, unfixed reality. No wonder there's this underlying existential uneasiness because the view doesn't line up with reality, which is the basic definition of wrong view. A human being or you and me operating with a framing mechanism that is grossly out of alignment with the way it is. And the natural, inevitable, appropriate result is anxiety or uneasiness or fear or a sense of something missing, unsettled. And we call that in Buddhism dukkha. That's the deeper sense of dukkha. So then if we're lucky, we bump into somebody who's artic who out of the depth of their own direct immediate experience, then articulates out of compassion for those people who don't get it, provide something that can begin to neutralize wrong view in a way that sets up insight. What is this without the toxic effects of wrong view? What is it to be a human being to be experiencing without the confining stressful effects of wrong view. And you'll notice, you know, as you play with each of those four instructions, honey, it's really okay to relax, recognizing there is awareness, keeping awareness in mind, playing with wise view. This is nature. It's a natural process. Everything is a there is nothing outside of natural processes, interdependent. So whatever feels personal is totally fine. I'm just gonna recognize what feels very personal as a natural process. I don't need a different experience. Like when we think, oh, this is a natural process, so therefore it should look like this. No, we don't have to do that second step. It's more like let things be what they are, but practice as we let it be what it is, practice seeing it through that lens. Yeah, this is nature. Sometimes nature looks and feels like this and it's moving, it's alive. A natural process, you know, part of the reason we use those words or whatever, you know, articulation, because, you know, different teachers talk about the Buddha's teachings on wise view in different ways, but all of the useful ways will talk about it as something that's alive with change. It's not like a fixed metaphysical truth that we're kind of aligning with. And then like, I've got the edifice of truth. 
and I'm holding tight to it. And my edifice of truth is pretty impressive looking and, you know, makes all the other edifices of truth look weak and feeble. But it's, it's unknowable, like wise view is unknowable because it's a living, evolving thing. That's the, the point. Wise view is the view that eliminates the mind's habit of looking for a fixed view. It so humiliates fixed views as being unhelpful, unwise, and not in alignment with the way it is, that the mind regrettably has to abandon wrong view because it just can't be held. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up. And it uh, can be a disorienting and painful process because something is dying. Wrong view is dying. <laughs> and like, you know, it may not be real in the way we think it's real, but it's as real as anything's real. But it turns out, you know, we didn't, no one ever needed it anyway. It was just an unnecessary weight. So those are some reflections to just support our practice. And I really encourage you, you know, I'm sure you've already can't forget these four instructions because Shelley and I have repeated them a number of times and you can hear more and more about them, but mostly hopefully you're gonna hear, hear about them from yourself and you can go to whatever one you're attracted to because they all lead to the other three. You know, wise view, when you really reflect on everything as a natural process, tension being tight just doesn't make sense when everything is happening on its own. I think Shelley said that earlier today. You know, it's all happening on its own. That's what it means that everything is a natural process. So all of a sudden being bound up seems so maybe it's not needed. You know, this sort of defensive stance that we tend to have. And it's, it, it moves the heart in the direction of the mystery. So the interest, the recognition of the present moment and the knowing that's really there already, it just happens. In the same way of, you know, if you're really interested in awareness, it's just like, oh yeah, there's awareness. You'll just start recognizing the Buddha's uh, pointing out about wise view because what awareness reveals isn't some kind of fixed truth like I just mentioned. It just, it, it reveals this unfolding, unfixed movement. Everything is movement. Uh, I'm sorry, everything is moving. And that movement is related, interrelated like nothing is outside of everything else. Nothing stands outside. You know, I know it sounds like a cl cliche when we say, well, everything's connected, but that's the felt sense. It's not a thought. It's a, a kind of a, a sensory experience. Sometimes practitioners will talk about it as, because it, it has a healing pleasantness to it, and they'll talk about it as like a wholeness or like Ajahn Sushito said, a completeness. So let's leave the words here and just sit together for about nine minutes to finish up our time. Then we'll have um, 30 minutes of walking and we'll come back for one more sit. But with your eyes open or closed, And just in your own way, the silence of your own heart, just revisit these four instructions and really learn to make them your own. But build some confidence that you can recall them and you're beginning to know how to play with them. 
see how they might be useful.
So we have some walking practice next. And uh, remember, you don't have to systematically go through those four instructions. But when you're, you know, lost in thought or whatever, and you then recognize that, then it might be just see which of the four seems interesting to the mind and just let it come into the forefront and shape how your practice unfolds from there. So use them. They're really meant to be used as you do your practice. Good. So we'll come back at 8.30 Minnesota time for one more set.